I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of Explosion 4. Got fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Please, I was never given the payday. Has you been accounted for? Okay. 610B, now is the main date, 610B. I'm out uh, here, we got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling, fire shown from the second floor, give me a second alarm on this. See up there, the top floor, I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. Got people on the front fire escape here with windows fences below them, we need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary stretches are underway. Hey, we're back with another episode of Old School. I'm Rick Lasky, along with my buddy, John Salka. Um, John, before we get started uh, with this particular show, I know folks listen to these for months Golly, we, we, we're into tens of thousands of uh, downloads now. So thank you to those that, that listen in and share this with, with those around the firehouse and those they work with. Um, but, but this particular one, John, um, we're the day before Veterans Day. Day before Veterans Day. And uh, you've got uh, two of your five kids are veterans. Um, uh, Brian, who's a firefighter with uh, North Charleston, served the Marine Corps. Uh, uh, and then your son, James, uh, is presently a captain with the Marines. Um, I always joke with you. I don't mean to embarrass him, but I always joke with you. When you told me he was going to the Marine Corps, I said, I know who the next commandant of the Marine Corps. I'm going to be sitting next to the commandant one day, you know, smoking a cigar, watching the, 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 the graduation, you know, class. And the, uh, anyway, just that being said, uh, my son, you know, I haven't been a, you know, FMF corpsman with the Navy attached to the Marines. Um, uh, I don't think we should proceed without uh, recognizing that, uh, it's not Memorial Day. It's Veterans Day. This time, it's time. Or, you know, so many people, John, you've said it before. Memorial Day is not the day to post pictures of yourself, and I did this, and I did that. and All that Memorial Day is there to remember those that, that sacrificed for us so we can live a, a life of freedom. So people worldwide and what we've done. But Veterans Day is one to recognize those that have stepped up to serve and actually celebrate the lives of them, right? Right. There's those that are still amongst us that have served, which is... Uh, pretty easy. I guess it's another symptom of modern society. Everybody just makes every holiday what they want to make it. And uh, rather than what it really is, um, I don't think it's deliberate or malicious. I think it's just a bit of laziness and people just interchange Memorial Day for Veterans Day for Flag Day. And, you know, they just want to wave the flag and get a special price for a Dunkin' Donut uh, coffee or something. <laughs> and uh, it just sort of annoys me sometimes that people don't take the minute it is to just specify, tell, explain to their children and say, you know, you would think this would be taught in school. You know, people say, oh, that's not taught in school anymore. The answer is, I don't know what's taught in school anymore, but uh, it is, in fact, Veterans Day, which is, we're celebrating those that are still amongst us, those that served and are, and are now home with us. Exactly. And, you know, and I agree with you, you know, like Memorial Day, you see people once in a while pop off about to all you out there barbecuing and doing your stuff, remember what this day is about. It's not just a holiday week. And I'm like, you know, I know you're, you're right, but there's a lot of people out there that, you know, they're trying to rub two nickels together to make a quarter. They're working two jobs or a two income family to put you know money into a college fund. And, you know, it is a weekend. It is a time. And, you know, they know they, you know, I think those people truly in their hearts know, John, I really do and appreciate those, but thank you to all our veterans uh, for what you do. Uh, what's the number, John? Like less than 1% of our nation's population actually ends up serving or volunteers to serve. Uh, that, that's funny you used to say that because I just read it this morning and I'm, and I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember the number, but it was an a infinitesimally small number of people that uh, have served the country. Yes. Well, like you say, if you want to talk about a special group, there you go. And you and I have both taught for pretty much all the branches. Um, uh, we love that. Um, I always joke. Uh, since today is the Marine Corps birthday, by the way, I, yeah. uh, I went ahead and posted that. Um, uh, that being said, uh, they're the only ones, John, you heard me say class, but they're the only ones that I can't get, I can't get to laugh. You know, the other ones you can, you can, you know, say something funny or come up with a quick thing and all of a sudden you'll get a little smile or chuckle. You know, they sit there in those chairs, hands that, you know what I'm saying? They're, and they're just attentive. They're the only, first of all, they're the only class I've ever had that gets there like early. <laughs> <laughs> yep. and they in fact 
I, I got them to kind of smirk. Uh, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, just a little bit, 28 Palms. I remember I told you, I used the slide with the picture of my friend, Bruce Crandall, Colonel Bruce Crandall, um, Medal of Honor recipient, you know, from Vietnam, uh, the, the pilot, we, you know, from We Were Soldiers and all that. Um, and, you know, you know how much we love our Marines. We love all our branches. But, you know, remember I, I found that article about him, you know, what he talked uh, uh, to that, that new Medal of Honor recipient at the White House about, um, um, and, you know, you know, the passing of why you're getting the medal and how you, re- you know, who you represent and all that stuff. And I was so excited to use it. And I didn't even think till I put the slide up there in front of like 500 Marines and sailors. I went, yep. Oh crap. I said, all right. So I know this is a soldier. I know this is a soldier. You, you remember Jason, our friend, Jason Fry, right? Captain Jason Fry. I, um, I picked him up at the airport when he was doing a talk for us at the heroes of Denton County. You actually spoke there as well in front of a couple thousand people there. A great fundraiser. And I, 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 he was asking about the success of the department and stuff. I said, you know, Jason, I just, I, I always remind my guys, you know what, just, you know, to the bosses, let your guys play firefighter. Let them play soldier, and, and they'll be really good. He goes, do you want them to be great? I go, yeah. He goes, tell them, tell them to let them play Marine. And I went, oh, there you go again, you know. So, but uh, anyway, hey, uh, so again, lastly, to our veterans, thank you. God bless you. We love you, uh, especially from these two families. Um, but, John, let, let's talk. Um, uh, I was talking with a couple of uh, my partners at the volunteer fire department that I serve with officially, Wichita West uh, in Texas here. Great volunteer fire department, Chief Ryan Fetzer and Michael and all the guys that are running the show there. And it's so much fun, John, to see the younger members that are like brand new, you know, like half of them are brand new and, you know, they're just getting into it. And, um, um, you know, they're, I mean, and, and, the time, and we start talking about, I was looking at the pumper going, I could do, two drills a week for two years on this pumper and never run out of topics. And I was talking about, you know, to one of the new ones, they were looking, t- talking nozzles. I said, okay, so, so Chris takes that, you know, you, you go in, you go with your partner, you're going to relieve him on the line. He and his, his partner, they're going to go out and change bottles. And he hands, hands you the nozzle. We still got fire to fight. And as he hands it with the fog nozzle, and I showed how easy with this one nozzle, as it rolls across the floor, it rolls from a straight stream mode to a fog stream mode. That it was that easy. One of these loose ones, right, John? And yeah. I said, so before you open this up and this whole righty, tidy, lefty, loosey thing, which works, how can you really immediately right now within a second tell if that's in the, you know, smooth versus uh, straight stream versus fog? And, and it was a guy and a gal, and they, they, they said, well, I'm not sure. I said, well, here, this is the stuff. These are the, the little five-minute training session you do here when it comes to engine ops and that. I said, all right, close your eyes. I said, take your hand and, you know, your left hand, reach up to the top on the end of the nozzle and feel, is it flush? And they're like, yeah. I say, okay, then it's in a fog pattern. All right, now with your eyes closed, feel it again. And they go, well, okay, can you stick your fingers down inside the coat? They go, yeah. I said, all right, so you're in a straight stream mode. I go, I mean, with a gloved hand, you can just reach up and go, before I screw up the whole room and steam it and throw this wide pattern fog and all that, I said, there's all these little tricks that all these guys have been doing this stuff for a long time. No. And I brought up your engine ops book, which is still a bestseller. If you're, if you, if you ride a fire engine, you should have that book or have it at your department's library, by the way, written by John J. Salka Jr. That being said, um, you know, you, you've over the years, you've come up with some pretty slick um, little, I call them cheaters, little quick things like, you know, if you know, you vote in class, you say, okay, inch and a half. So what are we flowing out of inch and a half? And you'll say, well, 150. What are you flowing on inch three quarter? Uh, I say, what are you flowing to? And, and, you know, simple things. Like I've always talked about the things from my, one of my mentors, Chief Eddie Enright from Chicago. And, and while we're talking engine ops, John, um, you know, he's the one that told me a long time ago, Rick, Rick, before you char- when you, when you charge the system, you know, if you pull up and I say ch- charge the system, right? You know, um, sprinkler building, warehouse or whatever. He says, you know, obviously you're going to make your hydrant, you're going to connect your, you know, everything, you're all set to go. And you go, he goes, before you open your intake, before you open that, again, hook to the hydrant, hydrant charge right up to the side of your pump or front or whatever, before you open your intake from the hydrant, charge the system with your tank water. And this is back with 500 gallons. And I said, but he goes, look, you're out of hydrant. The hydrant's good. You know that he goes, but look at how many things you can tell me. God bless. I, you know this. I love Eddie and right. You do too. You, I don't think you ever met him and you love him. He said, 
He says, so I'm the incident commander. What are the things you could tell me? Remember the whole phrase, what'd you do at the fire? Oh, I was just driving. I was just pumping. Well, here, here comes some invaluable stuff. He says, so you charge it with tank water. Again, I'll remind everybody, you're hooked at a hydrant. Hydra's charged. Hydra's good. You're right up, right up to your, 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 your intake, but you don't open it up to the pump. He says, charge it with your tank water. So what do most sprinkler heads flow? inside this particular warehouse, inside this big box store or whatever, how many gallons of water per minute it was okay. So you charge it with tank water and you start seeing it drop fairly quick. He goes, you should be telling me chief, I don't know what you got going in there, but I'm, 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 I'm pushing a lot of water in it, which is going to tell me that even I have had a cash stock of failure, maybe explosion or something of the standpipe system, or I have multiple heads off. Right. He says, now you, you charge a system and nothing. We've got smoke and you're not seeing anything. You're like, all right, they've been in there. They're charging. They said, you know, I can hear them. They're talking. He goes, tell me about that. He goes, either someone tampered or screwed with the heads or he said, maybe, maybe we've got, it's a, it's, it, we've got a big time cold smoke situation. You know, you know what I'm saying? He was, and it hasn't, it hasn't got hot enough to fuse the link. And I'm like, John, all these little tricks, like talking about the Nas last night at, at, at Wichita West, at the fire department and you all the little tricks of the trade you've talked about i thought what a great topic let's talk engine ops and why we need water i know it kind of sounds silly but why we need water you would think people would know that but how many times john have you seen people pass a hydrant um and we'll talk reverse versus forward but pass a hydrant when you know your second engine still a ways away right um not knowing what they've got for tank water not knowing what they've got coming out of the ends of their nozzle so you know first of all i guess my question you know uh, John would be, how would you answer? How, what would you tell one of your new volleys or your new probies in the FDNY about the importance number one of knowing the now we've said this a bunch of times in the show, the importance of knowing your nozzle size, what comes out of your nozzle and your tank. Well, let's talk about those two things real quick before we talk about the rest of it, the importance of knowing what's coming out of the end and how much you got to come out of the end. Right. I mean, you know, it, it's really not, and we say this all the time, it's really not rocket scientists. However, it's all really important stuff. And, it, and it, there's not a whole lot of stuff. There's not a list of 10 or 12 different things you need to know to be a decent engine man, just to have basic knowledge of what, what, you, what you're about to do. Obviously, w without any thought at all, anybody who rides a fire engine should be able to answer, how big is the tank? How much water do they carry? What size hole size do they have? What kind of pre-connects or, or you know, attack lines do they have? How many of them? How many attack lines do they have? What sizes are they? And what comes out though? And what comes out? What what's delivered by those by those attack lines? That that basic knowledge, you should have some idea. Now, obviously, bigger fire departments or, or even smaller ones that have domestic water supply, hey, you got to know that as well. If you if you have a hydrant system, how to connect to it? Do you lay in? Do you lay out? Everybody does something different. There are things that. A majority of us do and some people do it differently and there are some things that everybody does differently so i mean i think i mentioned four things so far that the average engine firefighter engine officer needs to know about about water relative to water well and how many times have we said this you and i've been somewhere having coffee you know we go teach a program all day we go have supper at the firehouse and then the guys or beforehand before supper they're walking us around while they're finishing cooking, showing us their rigs. And you and I look up and say, okay, I can't really see the nozzle because they have it wrapped up in there with their inch three quarter, right? What kind of nozzle do you have up on your pre-connect? You know, oh, we got the double fangoulie. You know, there's so many brands out there anyway. You know, they all work They all work fine, I'm sure. And and you and I will ask them, so what does it flow? And, they, and what do you guys get out of it? And how many times, John, have you seen guys look and go, and then they start guessing. They even do it in class, right? 150? No, no, 175, dude. No, we flow 185. Well, is it a 15, 16 smoothbore, an inch three quarter? I, I buy that, or seven eighths inch smoothbore tip. But let's talk about your fog nozzles and, and are they low pressure, you know, 100 psi, or whatever. What what are you flowing? I mean, I'm not saying shame on them, but I guess I'm saying wake up to the the training officer, maybe the bosses that. You know, it shouldn't you said it? Everybody should be dialed in as to what the, you know. Your son James is home right now, Captain of the United States Marine Corps. Okay, uh, combat veteran, multiple times over, multiple times. Bronze, bronze star with the Valor device twice. Purple Heart. He knows just like my son knows. He knows he could he could he could squeeze off a couple of short bursts, and I bet you he could tell you within one round what he's got in his gun. You know what I'm saying? He's right. You know, you know what I'm saying? Every Marine you know, is a rifleman, like they say, that every sailor's a firefighter. 
every Marine knows how many bullets are in a gun. As a firefighter, you're going in and fighting this, this, this enemy, but you don't know what's coming out of your nozzle. And some officers think, well, I got a great chauffeur. I got a great, you know, engineer, MPO, and he's right on top of it. He keeps control of the water. He knows how much we got. He lets me know when I'm getting low and, and, you know, he lets me, and that's all great. But, but your firefighters and the company officers should have a basic understanding as well. They should know that they're flowing 100, 150, 175, 180, whatever it is on the interest recorder. And there is no one answer. There's a range there, right? Some people use a little less. Some people use a little bit more. Um, but everybody should, ha should have a basic understanding of, of the hydraulics, not technical hydraulic stuff, not, not formulas for, for relaying hose, but, but basic, how much water is on the rig? How much if we pull this hose, how much are we going to put on the fire? That's all. Well, and that, you know, let, let me ask you this. Um, you know, you've got both hydrants and a lot of rural area where you're a chief of your volunteer department, and then you spent well over three decades with the land of water in New York City, the land of, I think there's more fire hydrants than there's streetlights in New York City, you know, but the importance, John, of a sustainable water source, meaning either a, a hydrant for the first engine or, and before we get to that second hydrant, okay, or dropping your porter tanks. Um, all too often, I think people kind of blow that off as, you see it when they pull up on an odor of smoke and they're not out flushing a hydrant. They're like, well, he didn't say he's got a fire. And I'm like, well, if he says he's got a fire, don't you really want to know if that thing actually works and so on and so forth. Talk briefly about the importance of, of that, of getting that, saying I'm on a positive source or I'm on, I'm on, I'm on a hydrant or we've got a tank set to you as a chief. How's important? Back it up. You as the captain inside on the nozzle with your fire fire. I mean, and we all know that anybody who's worked in the engine, anybody who's worked in the fire department knows that water is an important, vital element of our operation for structural fires, at least. And um, obviously, there's a couple of ways. Some places do have a, a hydrant system where you can lay a line in or lay a line out or a second engine can lay a line to you or whatever that is. There's a lot of ways to, to use engine water. The second way is, and a lot of, a lot of suburban and, and rural departments have pumper tankers. So it's a tanker. It's carrying, you know, 2,500 gallons of water, but it's their first due rig. And the thing rolls up to a house fire, and it's got all the water it needs to put a house fire out. Obviously, they're still going to initiate, you know, a relay or a large dam or a hose supply or something, but, but they got a lot of water with them. Then, then you have departments that maybe just have a 750 tank or a 1,000-gallon tank, which is still plenty – plenty enough to go to work with, but, and, and they may, like you said, they may dump the folder tank and start a, a tanker relay of, of tankers that are going to just go to a water source, fill up, come and dump into that tank in front of the building and rotate back around. And in the, in the, you know, rural areas of America, that's a very, very common operation. Well, and John, and how you know, important though is it though, buddy? Well, you mentioned that, you know, and I think, I think where we need to stress it for, for some of the more rural operations the the initial setup of those first tanks isn't something you play around with. That's something you drop on the ground right now, whether you whether you need it right now or not, because when you when you do need it and all of a sudden you're running out, now you're gonna be back and cruise out and you're gonna lose probably ground that you fought hard for. How important you pull up South Blooming Grove and you and you're gonna do a, a tanker shuttle, right? With the port of tanks. I mean the importance of getting that first tank down, maybe the second one to it is vital, it, 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 isn't it? It's the difference between pulling a crew out because you run out of water and keeping them in there longer. And maybe when right. the there's really no discussion. I think, I think a great, uh, a great habit to get into is if, if you're going to use water, if it looks like you're going to fire smoke condition, anything, even minor, that tank should be, that tank should be down on the street. That should be opened up. And, and, and that plays into where do you carry it? You know, I, I remember some some small volunteer fire departments, they get the folder tank, you know, stored on the side of the towel ladder because they think when they get there, if it's a big job, we'll put the folder tank out. I'm saying folder tank should be on the first engine. So when they get there, they can open it up right away, and the next engine can come in and dump, or the next tank can come in and dump and start that tank of relay. So it, it even has a bearing on where you might carry that folder tank. Well, in positioning, and not to, you know, we're going to do another program on tanker ops later on, but positioning the tank so you're not boogering up the street, plugging it up. You know, I love I love seeing some of those operations I've been involved with where the first edge is up that long driveway, like, let's say, and they're doing their thing, and they dropped, you know, they left the line, <clears throat> you know, at the, at the, at the driveway at the, or at the street, right? They go up there, and now you get that second tanker pumper, a pumper that backs in the driveway with the front suction, with that shorty, John, right, that shorty of hard suction, 
that they, they back it enough and they, they, that thing swings out and they drop it right into there. You put that first tank right in the driveway and now you can sleeve it depending on if you're level ground or hilly or whatever, sleeve additional tanks and everybody coming up, especially nowadays with, you can either back up real easy or drop it off the side and just dump and go. I mean, little, little, those are the little nuggets. I always talk about that, that I know I gained and my guys gained out of your book, the little, the little gold nuggets, the little, you know, chestnuts used to say that you could run home with going, I read this in John's book and, and that's why setting up the tanks. Cause you only get one chance to set up for the most part. Right. You know? Another thing about the yeah. tankers is the newer, more modern ones. And it's been, they've been around for a while, but you know, every year, just like, engines and trucks and everything else they develop more uh more efficient apparatus now they obviously have a swivel some of them can dump off the side some of them can dump off the rear or the or the dump can swivel to the side so that so the tanker can pull up next to the folder tank and and dump off to its right or to its left whether you're coming in you don't know who's setting up the pumper the, the tanker shuttle they may have a a, a dry hydrant or a water source down here and they have you circling up this way and all of a sudden you're coming in with the left side of your apparatus to, to the fire building versus the right. And if you have the thing in the back that's flexible, that's movable, left, right, or center, you can do either way. Well, and, and you know, apparatus positioning, we've talked about, we did a whole art or, or a whole show on that one, apparatus position is key. So you don't, again, booger up the street. Um, it's, it wasn't a rural, it was a city, obviously an urban setting, but Tony Greco, our buddy Tony Greco, all right, yep. retired uh, dispatch from Hackensack, a longtime volunteer fire chief and firefighter, world-known photographer. If you've been to FDI, you know who Tony is. We both love Tony. He posted a picture today, John, and, and forgive me if you're the fire department, I'm pronouncing the name wrong. In New Jersey, is it Paramus? P -A -A -P -A -R Paramus. 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 Guys, I apologize. Thanks, John. Paramus. I, I, the picture, and I'm going to tell him later I grabbed it because he shot it down the street. There was like engine, engine ladder, and obviously there's stuff going on behind, you know, but they're all off to the right. They're all, as you're coming in, they all are against the curb, not just park, get off the dump. And there's actually cars on the other side of the street. And there's, and you can see stuff. There's enough room. If you had to drive another rig down, if you had to drop another line, if you had to drop a, a second line, you burst line, whatever, you know what I'm saying? You've been there, right? How many times? I, I know in some urban settings, that's all you got. I've been with you. You pull up down the street, cars on both sides, that's it, you're screwed. You, you, you can't pull off anymore. You know, you have it where it's at. I know a lot of your guys pull off on the side streets to get out of the way so they can keep the front open for extra engines and trucks. I just thought, what a great picture when you talk about ensuring that the first engine gets the, the water, you know, leaving the street open when it comes just to that little bit of apparatus positioning. And another thing about leaving the street open related to water supply is large diameter hose, LDH. So you got LDH, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna drop it. You get a couple of calls, you see some smoke, the first chief gets in, says we got a working fire. Now the first engine's turning in, and hopefully, depending on the neighborhood, depending on the water source, depending on the driveway length, a lot, a lot of, a lot of different factors are going to play a role in this decision. But so now you decide to drop your LDH, and you're going to drop 100, 200, 300, 400 feet, so so that the engine can proceed into the property, you know, whether it be a garden apartment complex and drive through the parking lot and get to the closest entrance to the apartment, or whether it's a couple of homes on a on a dead end street, whatever it is, you're going to drop your LDH out on, out on the road, out at the end of the driveway, out at the, the parking lot entrance, and you're going to lay it in. And now, again, if you're not careful, now you got this big squiggly roadblock. You can literally tie up the whole parking lot. You can trap a hundred cars in there and prevent even the second rig from getting in. And, you know, or the first tower ladder, which could be the second rig, the first ladder truck, which may have to put ladders up or something, right? So, Obviously, LDH is LDH. You drop it. It's in the street. That You move it when it's dry. You got to get somebody to think about that and kick it off to the side when it's dry before you charge it. Once you charge it, it's over. Well, let me ask you this, because we did this, and we had we had good success with it, was we shifted it off to, you know, we did, we did this thing off to the right side. You know, I mean, hose is hose. We moved our, we moved our large diameter, our LDH, off to the right side of the hose bed, so as, as instead of being, some guys put it in the middle, I think it weighs more than all this other hose. I think it all equals out after you load up a whole hose bed, unless it's different heights. But this way, <clears throat> plus most of the time you're driving, you don't want it on the left side. Now you're putting it in the middle of the street. You got a chance at least, if you're going to have to drag it or kick it off the side, less to do, maybe you have a chance of, of stretching it. And if you have a wide enough area where it doesn't even interfere. 
you know, it's interesting. I saw a lot of truck. Uh, it was a Quint, and they had some LDH on it because they, they, they laid their own line in when they were going in. And, and the hose was packed, you know, way up in the bed. Not like a hose bed for an engine, but like the, like the tool bed on a truck under the ladder. But that's where the LDH was. And the way they laid it was, it came out through a little, there was a little pigeonhole there, and there was a ramp going down. You couldn't see it. It was like a tube inside the rig. And at the back of the rig was a little compartment door. You swing it open. There, there's your, there's your, your coupling for your LDH. And where was it? Right next to the right signal light, all the way off to the right. So no matter where that hose came from, all up in the hose bed, it, it fed out through that little tunnel, through that little hose, through that little pipe, and laid right on the right side curb of the, of the road as you were going in. And that, that's, a, that's a structural adjustment. Right? So they, now they've designed a rig so that the hose gets laid properly, no matter where you have to pack it. Another great idea. Well, smart, like we've talked about before, you know, someone put, 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 you know, put their brain to work when it came to specking a new rig. Um, you mentioned, <clears throat> you know, Ford versus Lay. I know I mentioned it. Quickly, we're, uh, like I said, we're talking about, you know, why we need water, the whole engine ops thing. You know, and I, I, I've been places where some people are like, ah, oh, we never do a reverse lay or we always do a forward lay. You don't ever pass a hydrogen. I'm like, well, if I know I got an engine coming in behind me, you know, and I want to get in there, I've got, you know, a room and contest to be going or some smoke and I've got 500, 750 gallons of water. I'm going to get in as quick as I can to get water to the sea as far as quick as I can. But then if I know, and this is the whole radio communications, you said it before, knowing your area, knowing your response areas, your automatic and mutual aid components as to whether you do pass that hydro or not. Briefly, John, pros and cons of the reverse lay versus the forward lay and, you know, the, the particular settings. What do you think? Well, I mean, the reverse lay and the forward lay really, most folks pick the reverse or the, or the forward lay based on, you know, how their attack lines are designed. So if you get pre-connects and they're all four lengths long or two of them are four lengths and one of them is five lengths, obviously you're going to be parked in front of the fire building. Now, it would make sense if you asked me to, to forward lay in, right? You hit a hydrant, you lay in, you get to the building, you got your water supply line in position. The, the other end's at a hydrant where somebody's either testing it or connecting it. And it, you reach in front of the building where you want it because it's close for your, for your hose line fetching. Obviously, there are people that don't do it that way, like, like the FDMY. But there's not many that don't do it that way. FDMY pulls up to the front of a fire building, and we have not four lengths of hose, and we don't have pre-connects. Never have. We don't have a pre-connect. Uh, you, we have unlimited hose. So we get six lengths of inch and three quarter with, with 10 lengths of two and a half under it. So we get 16 lengths of hose. You pull what you need, three lengths, four lengths, five lengths, six lengths. You're going to do that quick, that quick adjustment. And then the rig drives away. Once you pull your three lengths off, no, he drives down a block, 100 feet, 200 feet, 500 feet, however far he has to go. And he lays the rest of the, the hose out. It just pulls out of the bed as he drives. And then he breaks it and connects it when he gets down to the hydrant and he's parked down the block. And then the truck gets in front of the building. So a lot of things dovetail here. You know, what kind of hose lengths do you have? What kind of water supply do you have? What kind of situation do you have with trucks and engines? Some places don't have any trucks. So they're not making room for a truck. They don't have to make room for a truck. There's, there's, they have all engines. So there's a lot of ways to look at the forward lay and the reverse lay, and it has to fit your particular situation with all those factors being considered. Good, good point. And, you know, and for, for, for years, um, for a long time, uh, Chicago had it set up where if you look to the front of their rigs, they just they didn't just have like a shorty that went to the hydrant. In addition to that, they had like 300 feet, you know, uh, of, of, of their large diameter. They have uh, they were using four inch, the red stuff, on the front. So, you know, what that gave them, John, was the ability to do either take it off the back and go backwards, or if they pull up, take it off the front and wiggle around and be able to hit it. And they that do the whole. A, that's a very cool setup because I wrote an article for Firehouse Magazine years ago. And it was about the Chicago, that alternate setup. With that. And I yeah. still can see the picture of the red hose on the, on the big front bumper of that bumper. Yep. It's, it's like having a mini hose bed, you know, on your front. Think about that. There's another, like, I, I keep going back to your little gold nuggets from your book and when you just teach. There's, there's somebody that said, why don't, why don't we just put, you know, let's put some large you know, LDH on the front. So we can stretch both ways. We either go pull it off the back. stretch it forward if you had to. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And, and you see that so many times. And listen so to, Listen to this, Rick. Listen to this. Uh, John Askin. John was killed when I was the captain of 48 Engine in an, in an accident, unrelated to the fire department. Um, he was one of the senior men of the company. Brilliant, brilliant firefighter. I never really got to know him. I knew who he was. He knew who I was. I was the new captain. 
but uh, he was killed shortly after I got there. But the stories about him still still linger, how, how sharp he was and the ideas that he had. One of his ideas that 48 did all the time, and it's not an FDNY practice, it's just something that 48 does. I'm sure there's some other companies that do it. If we were in freezing weather, and for those of you that don't have freezing weather, you can go get a drink now or go to the bathroom <laughs> if you want, right? But for, for the rest of the world that has freezing weather, and I'm not talking a cold day, 30 degrees. I'm talking about cold, cold weather where hydrants are freezing and pipes are freezing, real, real cold weather. John Askin and, and 48 would do it. If you had a job, believe it or not, we would lay a line in. We would lay a line in. They would pull two and a half inch, key the hydrant, and lay into the building. And when they got to the building, they would ignore that water like it wasn't there. They would ignore that hose line like it wasn't there. They would pull off their inch and three quarter. And what would he do then? Drive down 150 feet to the hydrant, stop at the hydrant. What has he got? He's got two, he's got two water supplies. Yeah. He laid a lie going in from one hydrant, and, he, and, he, and then he went through with the normal SOP of laying out, laying back to a hydrant, right? When he gets to the new hydrant, the second hydrant, he tests it. If it's good, he charges the line, and, and we SOP, FDMY SOP. But if he gets to the hydrant and it's frozen, he doesn't have to worry about it. He calls back and he says, turn that first hydrant on. And now he's got a secondary water supply already laying on the ground. What a, what a brilliant idea for cold weather operations. Right? And that's a guy that probably went through that with the, oh, crap, you know, what do I do now thing. Yep. Got back at the fires and said, I've got a great idea. I'll never let that happen again. Yeah. I mean, so, so let, let's dovetail that into the absolute, you know, I, I don't know how much more importance I can play on ensuring that the first engine has a sustainable source of some kind. Um, I know in, in Louisville, Texas, the first engine has the opportunity to grab a hydrant on their way in, or if they know they got crews coming behind them. And this is just knowing, looking on your MCT, or just knowing who's out of the house, who's not. This goes back to, like you said, are you listening to the damn radio all day long? Did you hear that Fours is on the other end of their district? And now you're going close to theirs and they're not going to be that close. Maybe you are going to, you know, screw, we're, we're going to drop our own versus they're five, six blocks, eight blocks behind you. You know, I want to get in there quick kind of thing. Right. Or that they're decision. out at a working car fire somewhere, your next, your next two companies and you hear them. Nobody yeah. else is going. It's not a big deal. It's just a car fire, but they're there. It's out on the highway. They got to stop traffic. They got two engines and a truck working. And all of a sudden you get a call for structure fire. You better remember that that's your supply line engine. That, that's your second new engine out there. He's not going to be coming. Somebody oh. else is. And, and most of the good departments you and I have been to, the good companies, um, the good firehouses, I should say, they've got radios on, you know, the, the, some of the officers are wearing a radio, other guys, are, you know, there's something they're listening to, and they've always got the ear, you know, kind of dialed in, you know. I go back to the competitiveness. Firefighters don't want to fail. They don't want to look bad, you know. And like I said, Louisville, so, that, so then the second new engines, absolute, I used to scream this in class, and they still do the second new engines, absolute, Nothing else matters right now. Priority is to ensure that the first engine has a positive source. I Meaning to say they're on it, and this is where language is everything, like, like we've talked about before, and you emphasize this, saying I'm on a hydrant versus I'm hooked to, you know, well, I'm on a hydrant. Does that, on a hydrant, does that mean your department, it's good, and you're hooked to it, and it's flowing water, or you're on a hydrant? You said the so, word. You said the word. Good. I got a good hydrant. means I got a hydrant that I tested. I got a good hydrant means you got water you, and you know it. And again, I, I remember going to a job one time when I was a captain of 48. And of course, who was driving? Willie Tracy. We go to uh, a job up with the 79 engine. For, for, first first of all, if, you don't, if, you're a, if you're a listener and you don't know by now, after all these years of either the old school podcast, the command posts we do, or any of our other shows, or been in our classes, if you don't know who Willie Tracy is, you, you, you've missed something because we've talked about this gem of a firefighter of a chauffeur forever but go ahead buddy many times many times so willie was my chauffeur that day and we go off to 79 for a job second due to a job off the rig and that was after uh we had some issues in the job and when we had just done a big training program for the job about water and about engine operations and stuff like that everybody was really keyed in on the second engine being the water supply making sure that confirming that obviously you're going to do something else if, if they're fine but so I'm walking up towards the building. 79's already got a, a line stretched, and I can, I can see their, their engineer, MPO, at, at, at the rig. And, you know, it was a visible job in a, in a you know, couple-of-story frame. And, and I go walking over to him, 
And as I'm approaching him, I saw the yell to him. I said, how are we doing? Are you all right? He said, no, no, I'm not all right. I, I'm having trouble with this hydrant. So I'm immediately thinking to myself, shit, right? I grabbed my radio. Apparently, I either wasn't listening to my radio or I was doing something else. I grabbed my radio, and I four eight the 4 H chauffeur. Go ahead, Cap. I said, 79's got trouble. He said, I know, I know. And I turned around, and I looked. Willie Tracy already turned the engine around, <laughs> and he's backing down the block. He's backing into the fire block. So we can drop a line at 79 and drive out and connect to a hydrant out at the other end of the block and supply them with water. He, he already had it underway. Now, I'm not saying the office is not important, but that, that's another sign of a, of a great company. Chief Captain Salka, Captain Smith, Captain Lasky, it doesn't matter who's sitting in the front seat. I mean, it does. But if you got a well-trained company, that was already – they already initiated that. He already turned the rig around, knew what he was going to do. You know, I'm sure he would have eventually called me, but I called him instead first. And it just worked out fine. And, and that was our primary, primary job that day was getting the water to the first engine to get water on the fire. Well, we, we backed them up afterwards. After we dropped that line, Willie managed it. And, and, and the crew and myself ended up going up there. We probably relieved the first engine after they knocked the fire down. But, but water supply is oh so important. You can't ignore it. And there are guys that step over hose lines that don't even know we brought them. You know what I'm saying? So you got to pay attention to it. Well, and that goes back to what you said about Willie. We always sent on this too. Stay in task oriented. When you stay on task, if you're an engine and your job is to get there and, and, and pull a line, that's if you're the nozzleman, that's what you should be thinking about. If you're the officer, you think about supporting that whole operation. And then like we've always said, like Tom Freem used to say, a good officer is the one that can predict his or next alarm. And if you're driving, just like Willie did, you should be thinking anybody, any we've said this a thousand times, anybody could pull up and fight what they got in front of them. Throw, throw some boomerangs in there. Throw some curveballs, and you get to see who the good officers, the good chauffeurs that, like you see, you turn around. Before you can say, you're telling him, he's like, leave me alone. I know kind of in a nice way. He's already, he, he was already minutes ahead of you with that. You, you know, and that's because Willie Tracy was always, always about trying to be the best driver operator he could be, whether it was an EMS call. And officers and engineers all over the country are like that, you know, when oh. you hear uh, Engine two to two chauffeur. I got it, Cap. That's his answer. His answer is, go ahead, Cap. No. His answer is, I got it, Cap. We're on it. He already knows what he's calling him to tell him about because, and that's the great thing about everybody being on a handy talkie. Everybody hears what's developing, right? So you can have an engineer or a chauffeur or an engineer and a backup man working on that already before he, before the officer actually maybe even discovers it yet, if, if we're talking about being the backup engine. Exactly. Well, last couple things here. Um, uh, I've always said this, you know, why, why we grab that second hydrant, you know, so many departments, good departments, I think it's an oversight, John, innocently, uh, that they need to f do some fine tuning where, all right, they're hooked to a hydrant and everything's just peachy and they're doing it. You see it, you walk up and you see one hydrant hit and that's really it. And I'm looking and I, you know me, I wander, I'm looking at, I don't see another hydrant with the caps off that was already flushed or another engine, you know, and I'm kind of like, you know, I just, that, I'm not, that's out of my comfort zone, you know, putting all my eggs. I got people in a crawling around fighting a fire and I have one hydrant. There's so many things that could go wrong. You know, I, I guess, again, it goes back to predicting what's going to happen. Like RIT teams do. RIT teams are always thinking, what if, what if, what if this could, what if that happened? Well, same thing. What if I lost this hydrant? What if I, before, just like you said, you talked about cold weather ops, what if it just, you just lost the hydrant, you lost something, whatever, the main, whatever, you know, having that second hydrant is, is, is absolutely, you know, I think a priority of making sure somebody has secured and they know they've got a, a, that, that second hydrant. And, and how, it depends on, and you know, it depends on how many engines you got coming in. It depends on the size of the building involved and the, and the, and the, you know, the extent of the fire. But I'll tell you what, m most fires I went to, Every engine, when they stop, they stop at a hydrant. If you're going to stop at a hydrant, you may as well unass the rig and test it, you know. So at the very, very least, the third new engine, even the fourth new engine, will probably be parked at a hydrant somewhere. Any fire could turn into a four-alarm fire. Any fire could turn into a seven-alarm fire in the Bronx. You get a frame, and all of a sudden it turns into this gigantic seven buildings on fire. And guess what? The third engine, the fourth engine, the fifth engine, they're all on hydrants. You may as well stop at a hydrant when you get there on the box. You're in the first alarm. Chief Callum, when he, who's, I, I love the guy. He was a great chief, and, you know, he was a chief most of the years when I was a captain and, and a battalion chief, and I learned a lot from him. And he used to leave a third alarm. He was a Bronx Borough commander. A third or a fourth alarm, he'd be walking down a block. He would question a chauffeur. 
He would question the chauffeur of an engine. Why are you parked here? We're talking about a third alarm that's been going for two and a half, three hours. It's over now, and he's leaving, and he's asking some fireman sitting in an engine a block away, why are you parked here? Why aren't you at the hydrant across the street? I mean, what are you going to do here? What could you possibly do here? And he would say something to them, you know? And they knew it. You knew if Chief Cow's working, you better, be, you better be parked in a hydrant, you know? Well, and you guys place so much emphasis on, a, on this particular topic, why we need water when it comes to engine ops, that you actually have a – a 10 code, um, you know, if let's say it's moving, fast moving, people trapped, whatever, and boom, first hydrant, second, and refresh my memory, John, that the, 1070, what is, 1070 means what? Means, means we need augmentation. Somebody's going to, you, you need to do what Willie Tracy did at that fire, except instead of somebody calling and saying to do it, you give it 1070. Now every engine is thinking, all right, let me hit a hydrant and lay into this building, lay towards the building. So, you know, from one direction or the other, we'll get some water to the building. And that's not necessarily just like, I just need another line of here. At 10, so isn't it more of a, I need more of an need, urgent situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Lastly, you, you know, you talked about you, you're doing that article on Chicago with the hose they had the extra you know, LDH on the front so they can go from the front to, you know, out, outwards or they can go off the rear to hit a hydrant. Um, you know, I, I've, I've used it in articles before. Um, our buddy Gordon or Timmy Oak, you know, they post some great pitch, especially Gordy, uh, when it comes to the hydrants. You see it all the time. The 211 engine in Chicago, and I, I believe it's still the same now, has always been the first new 211 engine, I should say. First new second alarm engine's priority is to secure a second high or another hydrant, their own hydrant. And then when they do so, John, they do it with hard suction they, forever. I mean, I have old pictures, really old pictures, and I've got pictures from the other day that you can look at. Just, just go, to, go to Timmy's or go to uh, uh, Tim Oaks or Gordon Nord's websites, you know, where they have their photos. You'll see oodles full of pictures, and you, you, you here's here's this hydro at the front of the side. This engine, I'm saying, hard suction loop to a. They bring the water main up to the street, and I and there, and there's no argument. This is not one of those. This is the stupidest idea ever. In fact, they kind of don't understand why other people don't do that. They're like, no, we brought we actually brought the main, the pipe up to the street into our rig. So so, and then what I want to ask you, John. The importance, lastly, of getting, we're talking about why we need water. How about getting the most water out of a hydrant? I saw a great picture the other day, again, in, in Chicago. Not only did he have his, his suction, his large suction, hooked, because, you know, Chicago has a lot of the other hydrants are the two big steamers, not the little ones. He had that. He had his hard suction. And then I saw one, you know, that uh, suburban department, they had, they had, you know, big suction, and they had hose to – they had three lines coming into the pumper off of one hydrant. And I think some people are looking going, well, you're only going to get so much water out of a hydrant. And we've proved that theory wrong because in Bedford Park, we had one of the first ones there to go to LDH way back when. Off of, we had a the two and a half discharge to the big five inch storage fitting. And it says, you can't flow the water to a thousand gallons. And we did. We proved it coming out of there that we could do it. Talk about, I mean, how about that about, the means of getting as much water as you can out of that hydrant. I mean, and that comes back to hydrant design and apparatus design, which some people don't think too much about, and, and it really needs to be done. Um, so what, what the thing you talked about in Chicago, they used to do in New York City and Manhattan. They used to connect with hard suction to the hydrant for years. We don't do that anymore. Now we got our big yellow hydrant connections, you know, 35, I think they're 35 feet long now. They may have adjusted that, that size on them. But as far as the New York City hydrant goes, somebody said on a main larger than 12 inches, if you take the four and a half inch cap off the hydrant and open it fully, you get 50,000 gallons a minute. That's a million gallons in a day. That's a lot of water out of one hydrant connected to the four and a half inch outlet. Pretty amazing. Oh, and it's, again, we, we start off by saying, Know how many bullets you have coming out of your nozzle, out of your gun. Knowing how much you have coming out of your your tank, and how much you have coming out of what's in the ground or on your porter tanks if you're in a rural operation. I just thought, I always thought that was so. You know, you, you looked at some good drivers. We used to do it all the time. You know, when you when you grab the hydrant, you always threw your ball valve. You know, uh, you always threw your ball valve on the on the opposite side of the fire. You know, that kind of thing, or the fire side, whichever your department. So you could, you know, you hit it with your big you know hose, and you always had the ability to throw a two and a half or a three inch length of hose on to grab a little bit more water out of that hydrant. I just thought what a, what a, what a, what a slick idea being able to grab as much as you can 
um, out of that water hydrant. So, hey, there you go. Engine, engine ops, why we need water, another great topic. Um, uh, anything to wrap that one up, John? No, it was a good one. I mean, like I said, there's a whole lot more that we can cover, you know, some other time, whether it be about folded tanks or about LDH. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to do with water supply, but uh, I think we covered a, a, enough for one, for one program. <laughs> I think so, too. And again, we started off borrowing uh, about five, eight minutes to begin this, this show to thank our veterans once again. Thank you to all the veterans here. We love you. God bless you. John, uh, email for you. Chief John Salka at gmail.com. And I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. And uh, appropriately for today, the Marine Corps, happy birthday to the United States Marines and to Veterans Day tomorrow. Um, we always end our shows, including the command post, we do our podcast for fire engineering uh, with the following. Please keep the men and women and armed forces in your thoughts there and prayers. We appreciate you. We love you. God bless you. And we'll catch you next time.